The 1950s are not particularly known for their quality cuisine. TV dinners, meat in jello, and casseroles galore like this fish pudding from 1954. So thank you to Bespoke Post for sponsoring this video as we make fish pudding and talk about the history of the kitchen stove, this time on Tasting History. Welcome to the new home of Tasting History. I am still unpacking and trying to figure out lighting and camera angles and, and sound, so if things change over the next few episodes, I ask for your patience as I try to figure things out. Though, seeing as I was in the last place for two years and never really figured out my lighting, maybe don't hold your breath on that one. Now, while this is a new space for the show, the home itself was actually built in 1952, and that is why I decided to do a recipe from the 1950s to christen the kitchen. And being from the 1950s, it is by far and away the most recent recipe that I've actually done here on the channel, but I thought that it was appropriate because not only is the house from the 1950s, but so is the stove that came with it. Actually, I posted it on Instagram, and somebody thought that he narrowed it down to being made in 1949, but I figure that is close enough. And we will revisit the stove later on in the episode. But for now, let's make a dish that would have been made just after this house and this stove were made. It's from the ABC of Casseroles from 1954. And the book is cleverly set up with different recipes for each letter of the alphabet. A is for American chop suey, J gets you jiffy macaroni, and T offers up tamale pie. But when they got to the letter X, it seems that it stumped the author, and so they just gave up and made XYZ fish pudding. Boil fish in salted water about 45 minutes or until tender. Drain, skin carefully, pick out bones, and flake finely. Cook rice with water, two cups milk, and salt for 20 minutes. Put a layer of drained rice in three-quart casserole, add a layer of fish, season with butter, pepper, salt, and continue with alternate layers until casserole is two-thirds full. To well-beaten eggs, add five cups milk. Pour over rice and fish and bake uncovered for one hour in a 350 degree oven. Serves 12. I love that they consider butter a seasoning, a recipe after my own butter-clogged heart. So for this recipe, what you'll need is five pounds or two and a quarter kilograms of haddock, or if you can't find haddock like me, any other flaky fish will work just fine. Three fourths of a cup or 160 grams of rice, two cups or 475 milliliters of water, two cups or 475 milliliters of milk, one teaspoon of salt, four eggs, well beaten, another five cups or 1.2 liters of milk, and butter, salt, and pepper. So I have to be upfront with you and tell you that I really was not ready for this episode. And I don't just mean like who is ever ready for fish pudding. I mean, I was not really ready to film an episode, but I really wanted to stay on my schedule, so I am filming this episode. But I am not even close to being unpacked in the kitchen or elsewhere in the house, and frankly, for the last week, I have been living out of a suitcase. Though actually, it's not a suitcase, but a beautiful weekend bag that I got in the Weekender box from today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post sends you monthly themed boxes with really cool stuff from under the radar companies, most of them made here in the good old US of A. All you do is take a quiz to let Bespoke Post know what you're into, clothes, outdoor gear, barware, and then they send you a box with awesome stuff like this box called Brew. It's a complete brew kit to make your own beer, so you can bet that I'm gonna be doing a beer episode pretty soon. And since I'm into kitchen goods, they also sent me this box called Chop. It's two blades from Marcelin Kitchen Alchemy, including this Alaskan Ulu knife. These are great for cutting anything inside or outside of the kitchen. I've actually been using it to break down moving boxes. So every month you are assigned a box and you get to review the box before it ships. And then you can decide if you want to keep it, swap it for a different box, or just skip that month at no extra charge. You only ever pay for what you get and you can cancel at any time. So to get 20% off of your box, click the link in the description and enter Tasting History 20 at checkout or go to bespokepost.com slash tasting history 20. Now let's make our fish pudding. By the way, every time I say fish pudding, all I can think of is that robot chicken episode. Da, 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 fish pudding. So first fill a large pot with water and salt it very well, about one and a half tablespoons for each quart. You basically want it to be as salty as seawater. Then bring it to a simmer and add the fish. Then cover the pot and let it simmer for about 45 minutes. And you want to keep an eye on it because yes, you want it nice and tender, but you don't want to cook it so long that it falls apart in the pot like mine did. Learn from my mistakes, they are plentiful. 
But even if it does fall apart, that's actually okay because it's going to be the finished product anyway. Because you're going to remove the skin and the bones and then flake the meat nice and fine. Also, while the bulk of the meat is on the filet, don't neglect the other parts of the fish. In fact, the fish cheek meat is the best meat on the fish. I guess fish lips make for tender cheeks. Once it's all flaked and the bones have been discarded, set the fish aside and rinse your rice. Now, when I first started this recipe, I thought that there had to be a mistake because it calls for three fourths of a cup of rice to be cooked in two cups of water and two cups of milk. And that is a lot more liquid than you would typically use to cook rice. Uncle Roger would be aghast. But as it turns out, it kind of works. So add the rice with the water and the milk along with a teaspoon of salt to a saucepan and then simmer it for 20 minutes with the lid off. And with the lid off, you're gonna get a fair amount of evaporation and so you end up with something kind of like a rice pudding. Now how that's going to actually work in the dish is anyone's guess. But what you do with it is cover the bottom of a large casserole dish with the rice pudding and then add a layer of the flaked fish over it and then a few scrapes of butter and then sprinkle it with salt and plenty of pepper. Then add another layer of rice, more fish, and more seasoning. Then mix the five cups of milk into your four beaten eggs and pour that over the filling. Then pop it in the oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit or 175 Celsius for one hour. Now you'll notice that this oven is rather impractical for modern bakers. Frankly, you could bake about six cookies at a time in it. Rather different from your typical modern oven. But what it does have that a modern oven also has is a thermostat to tell you that the oven is at 350 degrees. But that was not always the case. In fact, that's rather recent in the evolution of the oven. So while our fish pudding bakes and you go ahead and hit the like button, let's take a look at how this staple of the modern kitchen came to be. Now I'm not gonna give an entire history of ovens or stoves because frankly that could fill an entire book, but I will give a little background of how we got to the stove that is in pretty much everyone's kitchen today. Also the term stove or sometimes called a range can vary from place to place and from time period to time period. So for our purposes, I mean an oven that is paired with a stovetop because for much of history, those two things didn't always go together. The stovetop was usually actually the hearth or the floor of the fireplace or next to a fire pit. You would build a wood fire and could have pots hanging over the flame or cook foods in pans near the flame. The oven was generally separate and started out just as a hole in the ground that would be filled with hot coals and then you would put the food over that and then you would heap dirt over that. And they still do that in some places, especially at a luau in Hawaii where they make the pig that way. Then around 25,000 years ago, pottery ovens that didn't require dirt to be thrown on top of the food were developed in the Indus Valley in modern day India and Pakistan. Mud brick ovens were developed in ancient Sumer and around 2,500 years ago, they made one that had a flat top that you could put a pan or a pot on, essentially making the first kitchen stove. But the combination didn't really seem to take off as evidenced in the beehive ovens that were common in Northern Europe, East Asia, and the Americas or the large bread ovens of ancient Rome, which tended to be built into a masonry wall. Though those Roman ovens, like the one at Modestus Bakery in Pompeii, used to bake panis quadratus, would basically set the standard, at least in Europe, for about the next thousand years. Because these masonry ovens became the staple of medieval Europe, where most towns had a communal oven large enough to bake the bread for an entire village. And in many places, you had to use that oven as it was part of a feudal lord's rites. Everyone had to bake the bread in his oven and he got to tax every loaf. Pretty sweet deal, as long as you're the Lord. Now at home, most people were stuck with their hearth to cook most of their food. And the major issue with that was that the chimney had yet to really take off. The very first ones appeared around the 12th century, but very few homes had them until the 17th or even 18th century. And without a chimney with just a hole in the roof, your house tended to be a very smoky place. So much so that you could smoke sausages in the same room where you slept. Convenient, but not ideal. But the smoke issue led to some wonderful developments in the stove. See, the first home stoves weren't just a way to heat up food, but also to heat up the actual home itself. And if you could retain the heat, but get rid of most of the smoke at the same time, all the better. In Central Europe, this led to clay ovens being built indoors, often with ceramic pots embedded into the clay, which helped to radiate the heat outwards. They were still very smoky, but a lot less so than just an open fire in the center of the room. And they often had a flat top, so you could warm a pot while you warm yourself. 
Now, it was a far cry from central heating, but they could often heat the entire room, which was called a Stuba in Middle German or a Stofa in Old English. And that's where we get the word stove. Isn't etymology fun? This also makes the philosopher René Descartes 1619 claim that I remained all day locked up alone in a stove where I had every leisure to entertain my thoughts. A little less alarming. Now, by the 18th century, most homes had true fireplaces with chimneys, and the stove market was just primed for innovation and expansion. There were the jam stoves, or five-plate stoves, which were essentially a cast-iron box that was placed at the back of a kitchen fireplace, heating the room on the other side of the wall. In France, there was the castrol stove, or stew stove, and in America, Benjamin Franklin developed the Franklin stove, or Pennsylvania fireplace, which was meant to completely replace the home's hearth. The stove fit right into the fireplace and was designed to siphon a greater deal of smoke up the existing chimney, though they could also be placed in the center of the room and have a chimney of their own. The concept was improved with the Rumford stove, invented by Benjamin Thompson, who earned the title Count Rumford. He also developed a fireplace called the Rumford Fireplace, which many people in the fireplace industry think is actually better than modern fireplaces. And for some reason, at the end of the 19th century, they just stopped making them. Regardless, his stove was a huge step in reducing the smokiness of the food being cooked, which was always an issue when you were using wood to, to heat your food. And that was the primary fuel used up until the 19th century. And while that may sound charming, it does leave a smokiness, pleasant or unpleasant, to the food. And it was the same issue with a new heat source, coal. Mott's oven, potbelly stoves, Stewart's Oberlin iron stove, they all used coal or wood to heat the inside of a box just as it had been done for thousands of years. And the only big issue with that is it's really hard to gauge the temperature. I recently went to the Renaissance Festival near me and Garrett Gardena was kind enough to walk me through the process of heating an oven this way. Essentially, you have to build a fire, just like in a fireplace, then let it heat the bricks or whatever material the oven is made out of, which can take hours. Then you would remove all of the fuel and put in the food, and the food would bake using the residual heat. And this meant that you really had to time how you were gonna do your cooking. First, you would start with those things that really needed a high heat, upwards of 800 degrees Fahrenheit. And often old recipes would call that a very hot or a quick oven. And then you would move on to things like cakes and tarts that require a little bit less heat, often called a moderate oven. And then some recipes would call for a slow oven or a slack oven. And that is basically a cooling oven. And those foods need very little heat or they don't need a long time in the oven. Now, of course, there were ovens that let you add fuel while you were baking to keep the heat going, but for most smaller ovens, you had to take it all out and just rely on what was there. The other big issue baking this way is to actually know what the temperature is. One way to gauge it was to take raw flour and throw it into the oven and see how long it took to brown. Another way, the way that Garrett Gardena and her team did, was to stick your arm in the oven and see how long you could hold it there. But the quest for relatively consistent heat and precise-ish temperatures would finally be achieved at the end of the 19th century with the advent of gas and electric stoves and the thermostat. The electric stove was invented in 1882 and an electric oven was exhibited at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. The gas stove was actually invented a long time before in 1826 by James Sharp. But as almost nobody had gas in their house, it took a while to really take off. And then an oven thermostat was invented in 1899 by Frederick Robert Shaw. And for the longest time, I thought that that was Robert Shaw, the famous coral conductor, but it's not, it's Frederick Robert Shaw. And by the 1920s, it could not only tell the temperature inside of the oven, but it would release more gas to keep it around that same temperature. And it's a Robert Shaw thermostat that I have on my O'Keefe and Merritt oven. So let's take a look at this bad boy and see how it's similar and different than a stove that you might get today. First of all, personally, I think that it's just prettier than most modern day stoves, partly because of the white enamel, which makes it a lot easier to clean. Up here, we have a clock that still hasn't switched over to daylight saving time, and it even comes with a timer that I can't figure out how to use. Plus, there is a salt and pepper shaker attached to the sides, though the pee on the pepper has worn off. Then there is this oven cover, which can come up to be out of the way, or it even has arms to become a shelf. Then, in addition to four of the best, most sensitive burners I've ever had, there is a griddle, which is always kind of warm because of the pilot light. Not hot, but always warm, and if you had a modern stove, that would be alarming. 
Also helpful because I am always dropping things inside of the burners, these trays come out and can easily be cleaned. At the very bottom we have some storage, and above that is my favorite part of the stove even though I doubt I'll ever use it, the Grillivator. Essentially it's a broiler with a grill that will elevate up and down like an elevator to get it closer or further from the flame. And of course the oven. And you'll notice there is nothing inside because it turns out it's not working properly. So we had to move over to the modern oven which is uh, bigger and it seems actually works here in the kitchen. But I did find somebody who actually works on these old stoves to come by and, and work on it. So fingers crossed. But for now, modern oven. And here we are, fish pudding from the 1950s. I'm not gonna lie, it doesn't look too appetizing. It kind of reminds me of a quiche. I don't think quiche looks appetizing, but I, I, I do like quiche, but this just looks less appetizing. But we're gonna try it. Here we go. I don't like that at all. Oh, that does not spark joy. Hmm. Okay. All right, let's break this down. We got two flavors here. Both flavors are very nice. The fish, well seasoned, good fish. Rice pudding, tasty. They, they do not complement each other at all. And even worse is the texture. It's like, mushy fish. And that's not good. So yeah, I can see why you don't see a lot of fish pudding in modern day cookbooks. It's definitely something that, um, that I feel that we've moved past and, and that's a good thing. Anyway, thank you for joining me in my new kitchen and make sure to follow me on Instagram, Tasting History with Max Miller, and I will see you next time on Tasting History. At least its consistency isn't like chocolate pudding. That could be worse. Yeah.